So as I mentioned, this is a three-week course that uh, Rabbi wanted me to uh, dive into and, and share what I learned with you guys. And so the, tonight we'll talk about the trouble with Marcion. Uh, who is Marcion? We'll, we'll get into that all tonight. Uh, then the next week, next week will be the Council of Nicaea, what it got right and wrong. I find this one will be very important because there's also a lot of myths and rumors about what happened in the Council of Nicaea, and often they are not what happened at the Council of Nicaea. So not only are we going to talk about what it got right and wrong, but also clarify what didn't happen at the Council of Nicaea. And then the following week, the third week in conclusion, we'll talk about post supersessionist theology, or in other words, replacement theology, um, or post-replacement theology. So how, how the church and Christians have done a lot of work, especially since the Holocaust, to correct replacement theology. So actually in the last uh, 80 years or so, a lot of good work has been coming out. And so while each one of these courses will have its own kind of point and a lot of unique things to learn each week, the broad point of this entire course is that while the church is imperfect and has made tragic mistakes, everybody can come in, yeah. Welcome. Thanks for coming. So the broad point of each uh, three of these classes that I, I kind of hope that the combination of these three classes make the point that while the church is imperfect and has made tragic mistakes throughout history, which we're all uh, very aware of, we should appreciate the church for upholding the Tanakh and the whole New Testament as scripture, for defending the deity of Yeshua for millennia, and working on correcting replacement theology. So as Rabbi talks about frequently, here at Bethel, we are not anti-church, we are pro-church, and hopefully talking about some of this history helps demonstrate why we are pro-church. And so, as I mentioned, um, this is actually a new topic of study for me. I've, I've read a little bit about Marcion prior to this, uh, but I have done really my research for it for this presentation. So here are a list of some of the sources uh, that I relied on to uh, create this uh, presentation. And so if, if this topic really strikes a chord in you to learn more about, uh, I can send you this, this list and you can have a lot more reading to do. All right, so the outline for tonight, uh, we'll, we'll first talk about who Marcion is, who is this figure, uh, this figure on the right with his face scribbled out. Why should we talk about Marcion? Why is he a topic that is, why is he a person that's worth talking about and worth thinking about? What did he teach? And also, we are going to talk about ways to respond to an ancient heretic, both just from our, from our own reading of scripture, and then also we'll talk about how some of Marcion's contemporaries, how some early church fathers responded to Marcion in his own day. We'll read some of those primary sources, and then we'll talk about modern Marcionites. Are there any uh, today, if you've heard anything about unhitching ourselves from the Old Testament, uh, we'll talk about that guy. Uh, but this, uh, this piece of art is actually pretty interesting. So this is supposedly a depiction of Marcion's meeting with a Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, the author of the Gospel of John. And uh, the legend goes that Marcion approached Polycarp in this meeting, and he asked Polycarp, do you know who, who I am? And the myth goes that Polycarp's response was, yes, I know who Satan is. And so that, that just shows Polycarp probably didn't, this meeting probably didn't happen, Polycarp probably didn't say that, but the fact that that legend developed shows Marcion's reputation uh, throughout church history, and we'll see more examples uh, like that later on. So just to try to ground this a little bit more uh, from the historical context that uh, we already know, just so we get a better idea of the time period in history that we're talking about with Marcion. Uh, so we know that Yeshua was crucified and resurrected in 30 CE, the Jerusalem Council, uh, which was the first kind of organized council uh, at, that we read about in Acts 15, uh, occurred around 45 CE. The first Jewish revolt and the destruction of the temple uh, was in 70 CE. And then the Gospels and the Apostolic Letters were being written all throughout this time period between 30 and 90. Uh, but scholars think that John and Revelation are probably the last books being written around 90 CE. So right near the end of the first century. And then the second Jewish revolt uh, is in 132 CE, and then from 138 to 161, Antonius Pius became Caesar of Rome 
uh, and he was preceded by Hadrian, builder of Hadrian's Wall all throughout the Roman Empire, and succeeded by Marcus Aurelius, the famous Stoic emperor of Rome. And the reason why I highlight Antonius Pius is, one, just to give some general Roman context, but also it was really during uh, his reign that Marcion was very active um, in, in spreading his, his message. All right, so who is Marcion? So he was born sometime between 100 and 110 CE and died around 160 CE. And so again, just to bring it close to that context, that means that Marcion was born about 70 years after the resurrection. And then, as we'll talk about, he arrived in Rome uh, 110 years after the resurrection uh, and only about 50 years after the last New Testament book was written. So this is very early on in what scholars will call church history. And so Marcion, he was a wealthy ship owner uh, and he grew up a Christian, uh, perhaps most likely a son of a bishop and maybe even a bishop himself. And the reason for that is uh, supposedly if, if Marcion wasn't already a person of influence, his false teachings wouldn't have uh, had such a big impact on the church. So many scholars think that he must have held a position of influence already, and then that's what enabled him to, to spread his message and really cause such a contamination uh, in the church early on. He was from the city of Sinope in the region of Pontus in Asia Minor. We'll look at a map to see that. And uh, as I mentioned, he traveled to Rome to join the Roman church in 140 CE. And so that's really when his message started being spread when he reached the church there. So for uh, a visual of uh, where Marcin is from, uh, if you went to Rabbi's Battle for Truth um, lectures uh, the last couple Saturdays, he inspired me with the amount of maps that he had. And uh, so I decided to follow Rabbi's suit and incorporate some maps. You have and some ones too? Yeah, yeah, I do actually. Yeah, the next one will be a little topographical. So. Uh, mix it up a little bit. But I also just want to, Marcin, he can, he can feel like a very abstract, very ethereal figure, so hopefully this just kind of like brings it down to earth a little bit. Um, but the, the area circled in with the dotted pink line, that's approximately the region of Pontus, uh, and then Sinope is where you see that red circle, right on the coast of the Black Sea, which is the town that Marcin was from. And so this is Asia Minor is, is modern day Turkey. And so we see in the south there Tarsus, which is where Paul was from. We see Antioch. We see Ephesus uh, on the west coast of Asia Minor. Letter of Ephesians is where Paul uh, wrote that letter. And then we see Athens on the opposite side of the Aegean Sea um, there on the far left. And uh, we, Pontus actually gets a mention in the New Testament. So in Acts 2, it says, There Paul met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus who had recently came, come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. So there's probably a Jewish population in Pontus uh, at the time Marcion was, was living there. Uh, but here, we see Aquila actually made the opposite trip. Marcion went from Sinope to Italy. Aquila went from Italy to Pontus. And so just to zoom out a little bit more, uh, there we see Sinope is still in the red circle right by the Black Sea, and then directly south a good ways is Israel and Jerusalem uh, in the big green box, and then uh, far to the west we see Rome in the uh, red triangle. And then we see, this isn't based off of any scholars, this is me just wanting to, to draw a little bit on, on the PowerPoint, uh, but an approximate, <laughs> an approximate route Marcion may have taken in his ship to get from uh, Sinope to Rome. So scholars agree that he, sh that he sailed there. Being a wealthy ship owner, uh, he did not take the, the much longer land route, and so he would have sailed right through the canal there, uh, where Byzantium, or later Constantinople was, and then probably pit stop in Athens, and then continuing all the way to Rome. And so upon arrival, uh, the story goes that he gifted the church in Rome 200,000 sesterces, uh, which was about $7,000 upon his arrival, which was a massive amount of money. So he was very wealthy. Um, some people try to say that he was bribing the church. Others trying to say it was kind of like a soft, like, like he didn't have a bad reputation in Rome yet. So it was just kind of like a gift, but like, hopefully this kind of helps me grease the wheels a little bit and in my influence here. But four years later, 
he was kicked out of the church because of how uh, much they disagreed with his teachings, and his money was returned, uh, which I think is, is pretty admirable. Uh, and then also he was a pescatarian, meaning he did not eat any meat, he did eat fish, but fish and veggies and fruit was his, was his diet, and we'll talk more about that later. And none of his own written works have survived. He did write, uh, we know that, uh, but none of them have survived. All we know is what was written about him by his opponents, uh, particularly his, his Christian opponents. Um, and so that's our main sources of information. Uh, some of them were contemporary to him, so that's, that's a good, good thing, but these are definitely hostile sources. So the rhetoric is often ratcheted up, but we can get little kernels of historical truth, and certainly what Marcion was advocating for um, in his view for what the church should be. All right, so why talk about this guy? Why talk about Marcion? Well, as, a, as what, one of the titles of, of the books uh, that I read to prepare for this, he is the arch heretic, the heretic of all heretics in church history, and even to the point where shades of his influence are still seen today. Uh, but he was a major foil that provoked the early church to codify and defend the biblical canon. Uh, so he actually had a, a, a major positive impact on the church in that he challenged them to the point where they had to like, codify. Even though all these books in the New Testament were recognized as scripture, there wasn't quite yet a, a stamp of like, okay, these are our books, these are not our books, and Marcin helped provoke that to happen. So as uh, Dr. Sebastian Mole says, uh, he says about the importance of Marcion, still as the first man to ever be outside the church for doctrinal reasons, Marcion marks the beginning of the epical fight between orthodoxy and heresy, but not only that, his biography of a man who is familiar with orthodox doctrine and then deliberately chooses to deviate from it would become a stereotype for future heresiologists, so those who study heresy. So what he's saying here is that Marcion isn't significant merely because he had uh, beliefs that countered what the church was teaching or what the Bible was teaching, but particularly that he was someone who knew what was right, being raised a Christian and possibly even a bishop, and then deviating from the truth and teaching those who know the truth falsehood. And so that really built up Marcion's legend within the church as being someone even worse than somebody who just without unbiblical beliefs, but that he knew the truth and departed from it and influenced others to, to do the same. So then the Catholic encyclopedia, they say about Marcion, as they arose in the very infancy of Christianity and adopted from the beginning a strong ecclesiastical organization, parallel to that of the Catholic Church, they were perhaps the most dangerous foe Christianity has ever known. So some scholars talk about how Marcion, being a businessman, was very good at organization. And so not only was he like a charismatic figure who, uh, and people were buying into his ideas, but he was a very good organizer. So he was a, essentially like a, a really effective activist and was able to, to organize a parallel church to the Orthodox Church, to the Catholic Church, as the Catholic Encyclopedia puts it, in, in a manner that was very effective. Um, in fact, here's uh, one of his contemporaries, Justin Martyr. Uh, he is a Christian uh, early church father, uh, born around 100 CE, so around the same time as Marcion, about the same age, martyred in 165, so pretty much the same lifespan as Marcion. Uh, Justin, he had a pagan upbringing, but he's a famous apologist. He wrote his Dialogue with Trypho, where he answers Jewish objections to the gospel. And famously, he was the first to say that the church is the true Israel. So he's kind of a father of replacement theology. But about Marcion, he says, And there is Marcion, a man of Pontus, who is even at this day alive. And he, by the aid of the devils, has caused many of every nation to speak blasphemies. So already, so this is about 150. So already, just six years after Marcion uh, visited Rome, according to Justin, his influence has spread across countries all around the Roman Empire. So Marcion was very effective at uh, spreading his, his teaching. So what did he teach? What did the Marcionite church adhere to? Uh, so they were pescatarian, uh, like Marcion was, and this will be explained by the theology that was being taught, uh, which we'll talk about. Uh, he forbid fornication even in marriage. And so... That is why, as we 
as another bullet, bullet point shows, that members of the Mar Marcionite church were almost entirely former Orthodox Christians. They were essentially converts to Marcionism. And that's because Marcionites weren't having any kids to naturally uh, repopulate the Marcionite church. And so that was another reason why they were such a threat, was because they had to be very evangelical uh, with their heresy in order to keep their church alive because they weren't having kids. Um, and so that was another reason why the church really didn't like him. Uh, they also fasted on Shabbat, uh, which some scholars think this is because it was a common Jewish tradition to refrain from fasting on Shabbat. So in an anti-Jewish move, Marcion was like, we're going to fast on Shabbat, unlike uh, the Jewish community. Uh, then apparently the services looked a lot like other church services, which is another reason why the Catholic Church uh, didn't like it, because if somebody wanted to check out Christianity, they could walk into a Marcionite church and not know the difference between that and the true church down the street because they looked very much the same in how they conducted their services, but they would sneak in the false theology. Uh, they were willing to die for their beliefs. Uh, martyrdom was a value in their community, which kind of went hand in hand with their low view of the human body and creation. Uh, we'll talk about that. And then later on, students expanded and modified his teachings. So one of his famous students is called, his name is Apelles. He taught that the Old Testament is unreliable and full of folk tales, and that it was written by an evil angel who approached Moses in the burning bush, which is even a lower view of the Tanakh than Marcion had. Um, but we know that the Marcionite church thrived for decades until about 200 CE and survived for centuries. And uh, we know this because in the 5th century, there was a Syrian bishop who said that he converted eight Marcionite villages to true Christianity. And then uh, there are Marcionite groups that are found in Arabic sources as late as the 10th century. Uh, so that just, again, shows just how influential Marcion was uh, in his message. And then I even found a Marcionite church website today. Um, but don't worry, it seems like it's just like kind of one guy and uh, definitely not as influential or organized as Marcion was. So definitely not as widespread as it was. All right, so what did Marcion teach? What was so bad? So I will get through each one of these in a little bit of depth, but uh, in brief, he taught that there are two gods, the one, the evil god of the Old Testament, and then the good god of the New Testament, and then uh, he taught that the gospel became corrupted. He taught that the Old Testament is not scripture. He taught from a limited and edited New Testament. And he taught what's essentially the most extreme form of replacement theology. All right, so Marcion's two gods. The first god is the creator of the universe. He is the god of the Old Testament, and that's the author of the New Testament, of the Old Testament. And he is the God of Israel, and this God is the evil God. And Marcion's logic for this was like, he was like, well, a bad tree bears bad fruit. We see all this wickedness and evil in the world. Therefore, the creator of this world is evil himself. And so that's, uh, well, that was his line of logic. And so he saw the creator of the universe is, as the God of the Old Testament. So the God of the Old Testament is the evil God. And then therefore, the second God is... Jesus Christ, he would say, who was not the creator of the universe, because after all, Jesus Christ was the good God. And so if the universe is evil and Jesus Christ is good, then Jesus Christ is not the creator of the universe. Uh, he'd also say that uh, Jesus was not born of a woman. Why? Because that he would have been a, uh, a natural-born creature, which for Marcion would have been a disgusting thing. Uh, he is the God of all nations, the God of the gospel, and not the God of the law, and specifically not the Messiah of Israel. Apparently, Marcion took some time to explain that Jesus is not the Messiah of Israel, but they're still with validity waiting for their Messiah to come, and Jesus is the good God. All right, so how would we respond to this, and what are some ways uh, that ancient Christians responded? So... A simple response is to say that Yeshua is the God of the Tanakh. 
And so John 8, 58 says, Yeshua said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And for context, we can see in Exodus 3, 14, it says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So Yeshua is saying he is the I am of Exodus 3. So this bifurcation that Marcion makes between the two gods, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, just doesn't work in uh, what we see from what Yeshua was saying. In addition, John 10.30 says, I and the Father are one. So the New Testament teaches that there is one God. And the New Testament teaches that Yeshua was involved in creation. So John 1, 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made through him, and apart from him nothing was made that has come into being. Then similar to that, Colossians 1, 15 through 16 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, the seen and the unseen, whether thrones or angelic powers or rulers or authorities, all was created through him and for him. So there it clearly says, for by him all things were created. But maybe you could say, well, hold on, it says he's firstborn of all creation. It sounds like maybe he was just the first thing that was created, and you just kind of ignore that, that next sentence. Uh, but to respond to this, it's important to, to know that in the biblical text, firstborn does not always refer to like order of birth. Um, rather, in this context, as we'll, we'll see when we read Psalm 89, that here it means the king or the leader of all creation. And we know this because Psalm 89, 27 says, and this is in reference to David um, directly uh, from God, it says, and I will appoint him, David, to be my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. And we know this isn't in reference to David's order of birth because from 1 Chronicles 2, 13, 14 through 14, we see that David was the seventh born son. So he wasn't actually the firstborn son of his father. Uh, so here from the context of the sentence, we know that firstborn means like the king of kings, essentially. And so that's how Colossians 1 is using firstborn of all creation in reference to Yeshua. And then we know that Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel. Uh, we know this uh, from Acts 3, 19 through 21, where this is uh, Peter preaching the gospel to uh, men in Israel, to Israelites, to Jewish people. And he says, uh, and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, Yeshua, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. So even there, Peter is pointing out the continuity between the Tanakh and the gospel, uh, which Marcion would not have been a fan of. And then in Romans 15, 7 through 9, uh, it says, For I declare that Messiah has become a servant to the circumcised for the sake of God's truth, in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. So again, Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel, and even here, Paul is remarking on the continuity between Yeshua being the Messiah of Israel and the patriarchs of the Tanakh. Uh, but this is actually a portion of Romans that Marcion would have left out from his letter uh, to the Romans. All right, so Marcion's view of the Old Testament, or the Tanakh. So he says it was written by the evil creator God, the God of Israel, but it does reliably tell the truth about the evil creator God. So Apelles, his, his future student, actually disagreed with Marcion on that point. Apelles says, no, it's full of folk tales. We can't even trust what it says. But for Marcion, it's actually very important that the Old Testament was, was trustworthy because that's what he would point to to prove that the God of the Old Testament is the evil God. So while it wasn't scripture for him, for him, it was a necessary source to show his evil God, good God uh, theology. However, he conveniently ignored many parts of the Tanakh that uh, display that the God of the Tanakh was a good God. Uh, so famously, Exodus 34, five through seven includes this, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, 
slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Which the Tanakh repeatedly displays in God's treatment, not only of Israel, but of the nations and withholding judgment um, and uh, giving steadfast love to, to all throughout the text. Then Psalm 145.9 says, The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All right, so now for Marcion's gospel. So Marcion was convinced that the gospel had become corrupted, and for this he went to Galatians 1, 6 through 7. He, he overemphasized this point. He said, where Paul says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Messiah and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Messiah. So while Paul is talking truthfully about some uh, people who were uh, putting the Galatians at risk in their faith, Marcion decided to take this and blow it really out of proportion to extend to the church itself and all across the Roman Empire rather than what Paul is talking about in context, which is a local group in Galatia that's uh, disrupting the faith of the Galatian believers. But here's what uh, David Wilhite says about Marcion's gospel. He says, Marcion preached the gospel about an unborn but incarnate Christ. Christ died to free humans from the creator God's judgment, and Christ's spiritual resurrection is the hope for his followers' spiritual resurrection as well. In other words, the body, whether it be Jesus's or ours, is neither here nor there. The point is to save the soul. So for Marcion, the gospel is not Messiah died and rose again into a physical resurrection to save us from our sins. Marcion's gospel was that uh, we are saved from the creator God's judgment and that it's not, we don't receive a resurrected body. Physical body is merely our soul that's saved from our physical body. So for Marcion, physicality was an evil thing and our souls had to be set free from that, um, which is obviously in contradiction to uh, how the gospel is talking about Yeshua's own resurrection, being the first fruits of the physical future resurrection of the dead, where we receive physical resurrected and perfected bodies. So he definitely had a, a different gospel than what was preached uh, by uh, in the New Testament. But that's why he had to uh, modify the New Testament. And so he had a limited and edited New Testament. Uh, so sorry if the text is a little small there. Um, but his, his Bible consisted of no Tanakh, obviously. And as far as the Gospels go, he only had an edited Luke and then 10 edited letters of Paul. So no Revelation, no 1st, 2nd Peter, no 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Uh, and he modified all this stuff. And um, while uh, Luke will talk about, uh, will draw out why Marcion decided to start his version of Luke with verse 31, and then skipping to 431, we'll talk about what he omitted. Uh, but then his next letter was Galatians, which was his favorite one, as we talked about. And then the rest are just ordered from longest to uh, shortest. But one of the primary things that he did to edit these texts as he removed positive references to the Tanakh for obvious reasons. So uh, Dr. F.F. F. Bruce says this about Marcion's uh, first Bible. He says, Marcion is the first person known to us who published a fixed collection of what we should call New Testament books. Others may have done so before him. If so, we have no knowledge of them. He rejected the Old Testament as having no relevance or authority for Christians. His collection was therefore designed to be a complete Bible. So what was unique about this was that we, we don't have any, especially Genesis through Revelation, like single bound books until about the fourth century. Part of that is because books weren't invented yet. Um, so like technology was still uh, developing. And so these things, so the letters of the New Testament and the books were still being distributed uh, by scroll, uh, perhaps by papyrus, 
perhaps by little codices, which is kind of the direct predece predecessor to books, but they weren't big enough to hold uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the entire New Testament. So that technology was still being developed. Uh, but so for Marcion to kind of bind these things together uh, was unique. Um, but it wasn't necessarily what his error was uh, because, because it took time for these letters to be distributed. It definitely took time for them to be bound together. So Marcion's error wasn't necessarily that he had a collection that was just Luke and some letters of Paul, but especially that he modified and edited them and then rejected the Old Testament as included as scripture. Those were his most egregious uh, errors. And so about his edited uh, books, Dr. Milton Fisher says, the heretic Marcion, by defining a limited canon of his own, uh, in, in effect hastened the day when the Orthodox believers needed to declare themselves on this issue. Rejecting, rejecting the entire Old Testament, Marcion settled for Luke's gospel eliminating chapters 1 and 2 as two Jewish, and Paul's letters except for the pastoral ones. So I believe that would be like 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, uh, and so on. All right, so let's take a peek into Marcion's Gospel of Luke. So this is Marcion's opening verse. So this is how his entire uh, New Testament starts. It says, In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip Tetrarch of the region of Etyria, and Trachonidas, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene. And Jesus went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. So, remember, Yeshua was not born of a woman, according to Marcion. So he skips the birth narrative of Luke's gospel. Uh, he essentially portrays Yeshua as just kind of poofing into the world. Like, okay, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, boom, Jesus is teaching in, in the synagogue. So what else does Marcion skip? So he, he skips the careful Torah keeping by John's parents in Luke 1, 5 through 10. He skips Yeshua's birth. He skips Yeshua's brit milah, his ritual circumcision on the eighth day. Uh, he skips Joseph and Mary following the purification rites requ required by the law of Moses following Yeshua's birth. He skips Yeshua's family going to Jerusalem for Passover according to the customs. He skips Yeshua's immersion where God says, you are my son whom I love. This evil God can't say that he loves Jesus. Uh, with you, I am well pleased. And then he skips Yeshua's genealogy, obviously, because Yeshua was not born of a woman and hence doesn't have a genealogy. And he skips Yeshua preaching in the synagogue, fulfilling prophecy which he would have had problems with because it would have shown that he was the Messiah of Israel and per somebody who uh, adhered to the Tanakh, to the Old Testament. So he had to skip all of those things. So Dr. F.F. F. Bruce again, he says, Marcion dealt with the text of Paul's letters in the same way as with the text of Luke's gospel. Anything which appeared inconsistent with what he believed to be authentic Pauline teaching was regarded as a corruption proceeding from an alien hand and was removed. So essentially, Marcion just presupposed that he was right and read the New Testament and took out anything that would have challenged his point. And so some modifications to Paul's letters uh, that we're aware of, according to F.F. Bruce, is that he removed Abraham as the prototype of faith in Galatians 3 and Romans 4, obviously because the way God relates to, to us, to humans, can't be the same in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And in Romans, he did not include Romans 1, 19 through 21, 3, 21 through 4, 25, did not include Romans 9 through 11, except for some select verses, and omitted everything after Romans 14, 23. So just as an example, uh, one of the things he skipped in Romans is Romans 3, 29 through 31, which says, Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So who, who wants to take a shot at why Marcin has a problem with this? Yep, yep, includes, the, includes Jewish people as being uh, subject to faith in, in the Messiah. 
And one more. One God. Yep. One God. That's true, one God. The law. And the law. So in this small cluster of verses, uh, Marcion's teachings are pretty much all refuted. Um, so he just took it out. And then he skips Romans 9 through 11, 11, which there we see Yeshua is the Messiah and is from Israel, quote, according to the flesh. So he didn't like that. And of course, throughout these uh, chapters, there's a constant, constant appeal to the Tanakh. According to NIV cross-references, uh, Paul appeals to the Tanakh 33 times. So that's just too much for Marcion. But he did keep Romans 10, 1 through 4. Why is that? It says, for Messiah is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So he obviously understood this as Messiah is, he terminates the law. The law is done, thank goodness, because it was so bad and evil. Uh, but we know uh, the, the Greek word there is telos, uh, which is better understood in this context as goal. So we should understand as for Messiah is the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So it's not a termination of the law, but a fulfillment of. All right, so now Marcion's replacement theology. So for Marcion, Yeshua is the good God of the world <clears throat> who replaced or even conquered the evil creator God of Israel. And the Old Testament is not scripture. It's just a book reliably showing how evil the creator God of Israel is is. So about this, David Wilhite says, Marcion's Marcionism is his teaching that in Christ someone or something has surpassed and replaced the God who created the world and who called Israel. Marcion's heresy is supersessionism. So I actually thought this was a really interesting uh, accusation that, that uh, Professor Wilhite makes in that Marcion's ultimate heresy is replacement theology. Um, and it's really replacement theology to the most extreme form. It's not merely that the church has replaced Israel, but it's that the God of Israel has been conquered by the God of the gospel. And so it's really the most extreme and most egregious form of replacement theology uh, that there is. Um, so um, for, for David Wilhite to call that out as supersessionism, I think is very astute and something to, to keep in mind. Uh, but what's very fascinating, though, is as we know, replacement theology led to a lot of actual violence against Jewish people throughout church history. But it seems like that wasn't the case for Marcion. So despite him having the most extreme version of replacement theology, there's really no evidence of his hating or mistreating Jewish people uh, while he was alive. In fact, he is one of the few people who did not blame Jews for the death of Yeshua. Uh, it seemed like he was just really focused on who he had a bone to pick. He was just really hateful of the evil creator God who authored the Old Testament, and he just put all of his energy into attacking that God. Of course, he thought Judaism was inferior, uh, but he did not blame the Jews. In fact, uh, he may have even had a level of sympathy for them and that they, they had to be in a relationship with this evil God of the Old Testament. Um, and he actually ultimately blamed the evil creator God for the Jewish people's plight to be in relationship with him. All right, <clears throat> so how did early Christians respond? So we've already talked about some of it. So his own father potentially kicked him out of the church, uh, there in Sinope and in, in Pontus in, in modern-day Turkey. Rome kicked him out of the church in 144 CE and returned his, his large financial gift. Justin Martyr and Irenaeus were contemporaries of Marcion and quickly wrote refutations against his teachings uh, that were widespread. And uh, Tertullian, a generation after, continued to combat Marcion, who wrote five books against Marcion. Uh, and they always defended the Tanakh as scripture. So they did incredible work to defend the Old Testament as God's word and as Yeshua being the God of the Old Testament. And they eventually codified and recognized uh, New Covenant scriptures as a collection of books and set limits as to like, all right, these are our books and we're going to authoritatively um, 
uh, preserve them uh, as such, including the Tanakh, of course, and to what we still see today. So Tertullian, uh, he was really the most influential in stamping out Marcionism after Marcion died. So Tertullian was born about 160 CE, so about the year Marcion died. Tertullian was born. Uh, he was the son of a pagan centurion. He was a lawyer or legal expert of some sort. He became a Christian in 197 CE and a priest in 200 CE. And he wrote five books against Marcion in the early 200s. And it seems like he had access to Marcion's writing. So that's one of the reasons why Tertullian is, is quite trusted uh, with his appraisal, despite some obvious uh, exaggerations uh, about what Marcion taught. So in the very first paragraph, Tertullian says this about Marcion. He says, Marcion is more savage than even the beasts of that barbarous region. For what beaver was ever a greater emasculator than he who has abolished the nuptial bond? What pontic mouse ever had such gnawing powers as he who has gnawed the gospels to pieces? So that's, that's one of the most articulate insults I've ever read. Um, <laughs> And so we really knew how they, how they operated back then. So you had to have some thick skin to do theological debates um, in, the, in the early centuries here. Um, but yeah, straight off the bat, he's, he's accusing Marcion of, of editing and corrupting uh, the Gospels. Then quickly, he's talking about Marcion's uh, teaching about there being two gods. He's very strong in uh, countering this. He says, but the Christian verity has distinctly declared this principle, God is not if he is not one. Because we more properly believe that that has no existence which is not as it ought to be. In order, however, that you may know that God is one, ask what God is, and you will find him to be not otherwise than one. That's fancy philosophical language, where he's essentially saying, all right, Marcin, there's one God, and we as Christians, that's what we adhere to. So if you're not with that, then you're not with us. And so then in uh, 1.19, he's talking about uh, Marcion's belief that there was the God of the law, the evil God, and the God of the gospel, the good God. And this is what Tertullian says. He says, Since therefore it is this very opposition between the law and the gospel which has suggested that the God of the gospel is different from the God of the law. Marcion, the author of the breach of peace between the gospel and the law. So he's saying Marcion is really the first guy who's saying that there's this really harsh distinction between the law and the gospel, which I found interesting to read. Then he says, Now this peace, which had remained unhurt and unshaken from Christ's appearance to the time of Marcion's audacious doctrine, was no doubt maintained by that way of thinking which firmly held that the God of both law and gospel was none other than the Creator, against whom after so long a time a separation has been introduced by the heretic of Pontus. So Tertullian, being very clear that the, God of the law, uh, that the God of the law and the God of the Gospels is the same God, the Creator, and he later goes on to show that Yeshua was also the God of the law and the God of the Gospel because of Trinitarian thought. There is one God. And so he was very clear in defending the Old Testament as Scripture. And so uh, we have him and many other early church fathers to thank for, for defending uh, the Old Testament scriptures against people like Marcion. All right, so more modern Marcionites. Are, are they out there? So is anybody here familiar with Andy Stanley? <laughs> what, what have you heard about him in, in recent years? Yeah, that's true. Definitely not following his father's footsteps. Uh, his, he famously pronounced that we should unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament uh, a few years ago. And so uh, in, in preparation for this, uh, I remember watching his sermons where that made him infamous for, for the lines like that. Uh, but it was all in preparation for a book that he was preparing to release where he expounds further on the same ideas. So in preparation for this, I uh, painfully read through uh, some of that book for you guys. And so uh, I don't think Annie Stanley is a modern-day Marcionite. Uh, 
but he is certainly Marcion-ish, and you'll see why. Uh, he, he makes it pretty clear. He says, It wouldn't be long before the violent God of the Old Testament became the violence-affirming God of the church. So two things. He's saying the God of the Old Testament is the violent God. Sounds like the evil God. Uh, but just like Marcion, he was also... He's also accusing the church that the church has adopted the violent, evil God as their own instead of what Marcion was trying to spread. like, no, you guys stop worshiping the evil God of the Old Testament and just worship the God, good God of the New Testament. So this is very, very much Marcionite, Marcionite language from Andy Stanley. Then he also says, Jesus was new wine. Judaism and paganism were old wineskins. The new Jesus offered was a departure from the traditions of both. Now, he doesn't clarify, so presumably a tradition of Judaism is that the Tanakh is scripture. But Andy is saying that Jesus offered a departure from tradition of Judaism. So presumably that includes the Tanakh. And then, just like Marcion uh, discussing the gospel, uh, Paul's gospel, Andy Stanley says, Paul immediately saw the problems associated with blending the old with the new. As an educated Pharisee who spent his adult life studying, teaching, and defending the law, he instantly recognized the incompatibility of Moses and Jesus. But as Paul saw it, embracing the new required complete disengagement from the old. So that definitely sounds like something Marcy might teach. But luckily, just like in ancient days uh, where the church successfully defended uh, Mar against Marcion, uh, there were many, many uh, Christian responders to Andy Stanley very quickly. And one example of that is Dr. Michael Kruger. He is an early church historian. And he says this, in response to Andy Stanley, he says, but there is a figure from church history who held a view similar to Stanley's, the second century figure Marcion. I only say similar because there are notable differences. Marcion rejected the Old Testament as the product of a false god. So Andy Stanley, he, he still say that there's only one god. So that's what ultimately keeps me from saying he's a one-for-one one Marcionite because he doesn't teach two gods, as far as I'm aware. Kruger goes on to say, Nevertheless, they both share a deep conviction that the Old Testament is fundamentally at odds with Paul's pure gospel. However, Marcion's view did not win the day. His approach was roundly and widely rejected by early Christians. Indeed, his story stood as a sober reminder for many generations thereafter that the church was fundamentally committed to the abiding value and relevance of the Old Testament. So for that, uh, we can be very thankful uh, for people like Tertullian and for people like uh, Michael Kruger, that while ancient heresies still find their influence today, just as in the early centuries, Christians are diligent in refuting them. For that, we must be grateful and do our part to do the same, because as we know, Christians also miss some details that uh, we can do our part in clarifying as well to make the counterargument even stronger. But nonetheless, uh, they have done a really admirable job in uh, defending the Hebrew Scriptures. So that's the conclusion, and so just to, again, review what we will talk about. So next week will be the Council of Nicaea, what it got right and wrong. I think that will be a, a really fun one just because of... Uh, how many here have heard of the Council of Nicaea? Yeah, yeah, so how many of you... What, just one person, what, what have you heard has happened at the Council of Nicaea? Yeah. They took the Jewish roots out of the faith. They took the Jewish roots out of the faith. Catholicism, anybody else? Yeah, 325, so this is in the 4th century. So we will learn a lot about the Council of Nicaea, uh, including that, um, but also more crucially, uh, what it uh, got right, and also what didn't happen there. And then we'll talk about poster processionist theology, so ways, especially since the Holocaust, that the church has worked to correct replacement theology, and in a lot of ways even repent of it, and so that should not only be edifying, but encouraging um, to see uh, what the church has been doing to remedy uh, that error. 
And so again, uh, the point I hope to make throughout this whole course is that while the church is and, and has been imperfect and has made tragic mistakes, uh, we should appreciate the church for upholding the Tanakh and the whole New Testament as scripture, which is what we talked about tonight. Next week, we'll talk about how the church has defended the deity of Yeshua for millennia. And then the third week, we'll talk about how the church is working on correcting replacement theology, which should all be very encouraging and should uh, help us uh, really be pro-church and defend the church uh, when uh, it is defensible. So that's it for this week, and uh, thank you, everybody, for, for coming. And feel free to come up and ask me questions afterwards, too, if you have any.